So due to popular demand, we are tackling the host. No, not director Bong's the host, not the host we already covered, and no, not even the other host that came out this year. Nope, we're talking about Stephanie Meyer's The Host, which is the first thing Stephanie worked on following Twilight. It actually released a few months before Breaking Dawn, and I didn't read it. I was planning on buying it until I saw it was about aliens, and that was just Clearly not what I wanted at the time. Give me vampire romance or give me nothing, Stephanie! But 12 years later, here I am, spending my time reading this book and watching this horribly received movie. So the book itself wasn't the worst thing I've consumed, somehow. Actually, I'm not even surprised. I've read a lot of really horrible things. And Stephanie described it as science fiction for people who don't like science fiction. But I kind of want to read that more as science fiction for people who don't want to think think. Does it have moments that make me question whether or not Stephanie is trying to push some weird underage romance agenda? Absolutely. Did that gross me out? Absolutely. But we'll get to that. Otherwise, this kind of has some compelling themes for a young adult novel. Wait, is this not supposed to be young adult? Did it get turned, was it retconned into? Okay, either way, we're gonna give it to her. It takes a look at humanity, what it means to be human, our passions, our strengths, our flaws, our no quit attitude, and why that's worth protecting, ideas of tolerance and forgiveness, issues with identity and body positivity, and how we take our lives for granted, and I can get on board with pretty much all of that, you know? But then she throws in shit like this. But you're 17, Melanie, and I'm 26. Why? But we'll get to that too. So the host tells the story of parasitic species of aliens known as the souls, who go around from planet to planet across the galaxies, taking over the bodies of the dominant species to, in their opinion, fix things. So obviously once they hit Earth, they were like, holy shit, these things are monsters. They can't even begin to get along with each other, but they have more than enough resources to go around, but still people die of starvation. There's famine, war, violence, and environmental destruction everywhere. So they start body snatching. And even though they're incredibly passionate and non-violent individuals, they don't see the horror of taking over another sentient being's body. It's kind of like if Animorphs got turned into legends from the Yerk's perspective. <laughs> now in the book, the only way to tell if someone is taken over is by flashing a light in their eye and then you'd get like a silver glowing ring of the soul body kind of attached to the back of the head. Otherwise, their eyes look completely normal. But for whatever reason, the movie just has these suckers glowing all the time, which kind of puts a damper on the whole invasion plan that allowed them to go undetected for so long by anybody other than conspiracy theorists? Like, I just don't understand the logistics behind that change. Daddy, why are mommy's eyes glowing? Like, they would have been found out instantly. I still don't quite fully understand how they managed to take over the entirety of humanity considering they are non-violent. And eventually people did start to catch on, so like, did they just do a really good job infiltrating world leaders right off the bat? I don't know, but I guess criminals would just randomly start turning themselves in for crimes they committed. Also, if you're wondering how these little silver blobs took over humans when they actually have to have surgery to be implanted into other people's brains, the book talks about this species that they first overtook called the spiders that actually kind of enjoyed them because it added more perspective to their lives. The spiders were these like very analytical, intelligent, but like not very feeling creatures. So they kind of work together well. So I'm pretty sure they use them to get started on whatever planet they go to. And then once they have like enough human hosts to do all the medic work, they just like send them away again. But because humans are so emotionally strong-willed, they tend to fight back more and many stay completely self-aware once they've been taken over. This is something that happens even more once they're aware that this invasion is happening because it's like mentally in your brain to try to protect yourself. And that's what happens here with our main character. Wanderer has been to many galaxies and this is about to be her ninth full life cycle. So she's well over a thousand years old. And she's given the host body of Melanie, a girl who tried to pitch herself out a window rather than be overtaken by an alien host. And they're like, oh no, no, why so violent? But all too soon, Melanie starts to fight back. Working hard to block Wanderer off from her thoughts of her brother and lover. Don't worry, those are different people. This is messed up, but it's not that kind of messed up. And by the time Melanie starts slipping, usually when she's sleeping, allowing Wanderer to access some of those memories, she starts to feel compassion and affection for these two humans she's supposed to be helping hunt down for parasitic implantation. They're horrified by violence, but have no issue squashing down sentient consciousness. Now, honestly, I was originally gonna talk 
talk about the book and the movie separately in different videos, but I just don't think I want to do that anymore. So I'm just going to go through the movie and toss in fun little anecdotes from the book or mention when they've changed something drastically to make it less fucked up. So you might assume that this movie got a similar treatment that the Twilight movie got. Lesser known director, smaller budget, but no. Still had a relatively small budget of 40 million, which also just seems like entirely too much, but they got a very known screenwriter slash director for this. They got Andrew Nichol, as in Truman Show, Andrew Nichol. But by this point, he had already made in time, so I guess it stacks up. So right from the get-go, the movie makes a couple choices that logistically make more sense than the book, while also still being very stupid. So in the book, Melanie leaves the safety of her brother Jamie and her lover Jared to go find her cousin Sharon, who she briefly glimpsed in a newsreel and believed she was still human. That is Stupid as hell. Your planet's been overrun by aliens and you're gonna try to travel cross country to Chicago to maybe find your cousin? Oh, okay. In the movie, they have a change that they get found when they're trying to make it to her uncle's hideaway. Jared's out getting supplies and she lures them away from Jamie, but then she's like trying to hide from them and somehow still ends up just running into a full group of them. But she legitimately seems shocked when she runs out and they're all just right there. Still pitches herself off a high place though. Barely a bone not broken, or organ ruptured. I cannot tell you why she is not dead. This one wants to live. Yeah, desire to live free. Not with an alien parasite running the show. Now the next major difference is once she's been implanted into Melanie, her seeker soul realizes a hell of a lot faster that Melanie's probably still in there affecting her choices. And that she's, you know, having some impure thoughts. These humans are not like the other bodies you have inhabited. They have unusually strong physical drives. You have to be vigilant. And Melanie forces her way out a little bit to attack the Seeker. So they end up locking her in a room where Melanie convinces Wanderer to jump out a window. Lots of window jumps in this. I'm sorry. So she runs and she's going to find her original medic to try to get things fixed, but Melanie's manipulating her into going the wrong way to try to find that hideout. And it ultimately makes her flip the car and she's totally fine. <laughs> Will it still work? Look, I saw somebody do that once as a kid and they got arrested and turns out they were on drugs and that's why they were able to run off into the woods after they flipped their car five times. But it's all for love, so let's go back a smidge and talk about the great Jared and Melanie romance. So one day, Melanie is making a food run and Jared ends up attacking her in the same house. But the second he realizes she's human, he kisses her. You're human. Why? Like, oh, sorry, I haven't seen a human in a couple years, smoochy smooch. Might as well assault you a little bit. It's so romantic. And then he does it again after he says he's not gonna do it again. So that's bad enough. But then we get that quote that I mentioned earlier where he's basically like, oh no, Melanie, you're 17 and I'm 26. It's just terribly incorrect and not okay. Also, we don't have birth control. The movie was smart enough to leave that part out. But these thoughts are essentially what Melanie has been like rapid fire flashing at Wanderer so she ends up feeling that same level of affection for Jared that she does so that she won't want to lead people back to them. You know, it seems to me that a lot of Wanderer's problems could have been solved if she had had something to drown out Melanie's voice in her head. Something like today's sponsor, Raycon. Raycon are the wireless earbuds that started about half the price as other premium earbud options. They sent me their everyday E25 model and they've been great. I love the compact design. They seamlessly pair to all my devices with ease. They sound great and they have six hours of playtime and you can recharge them four full times from the compact carrying case before you have to recharge the case. They're way more comfortable than other earbuds I've tried and they come with a variety of different bud sizes and colors so that you can find your perfect fit and style. These have been great when going out for walks and jogs and they made it super easy for me to listen to the host audiobook while I was keeping up with my health. I was always looking for quality earbuds that could be concealed by my hair at my old job and these would have been absolutely fantastic. Cause I may stick out like a sore thumb, but at least my earbuds don't. So if you're interested in trying out Raycon for yourself, feel free to click the link in the description down below or head on over to buyraycon.com slash Jedi to save yourself 15% off your order. If you're not satisfied, they have a 45 day return policy so you can find your perfect pair. So Carf lives, she wanders into the desert, uncle finds her. They realize she's been taken over by an alien, but her uncle wants to 
keep her around anyways. And then her aunt slaps the shit out of her. And then when she sees Jared, her lover, for the first time, Melanie's love is so strong that it makes her cry out and run to him, completely outside of Wanderer's control, where he promptly slaps the shit out of her. There's just a lot of violence. And the movie actually tones a lot of this down. She's slapped, slammed into rocks, attempted, murdered, all sorts of stuff. It's crazy that they're hostile towards a parasite that took over a loved one. But when her uncle finds her, we see that he's created this elaborate mountain cave dwelling with a group of remaining survivors and her brother and Jared have both managed to find their way here. And obviously all the people living here want to kill her pretty quickly. But Uncle Jeb is mostly curious as to why she wandered to the point of death with no semblance of a backup to hunt them down and her only concern being whether or not Jamie and Jared were safe. So he's theorizing that Melanie might actually still be inside there. But Melanie and Wanderer don't want to reveal that because she thinks that people will assume she's lying to manipulate them and they'll just kill her faster, but I don't understand why they wouldn't kill her faster if they just thought it was only the alien inside her? I don't know. There's, it's, I didn't know. For the time being, Jared's pretty conflicted. He doesn't really want to kill her, but he also kind of wants to kill her, so he's protecting her. But these brothers, Kyle and Ian, are pretty dead set on killing her. They're pretty positive there's a huge liability or a risk, and if she escapes, she'll lead people back to them, so this Ian guy tries to strangle her to death. <laughs> so this is obviously the start of a budding romance. You know, other than the fact that they love Jared, because Wanderer's starting to have feelings of affection for him too. I don't think that's really expressed very much in the movie, but it's it's definitely in the book. But essentially everybody that lives here wants her dead, but Jeb ends up making a rule basically saying that if anybody kills her, he's gonna kill them or they can leave. So that's mostly enough to stop anybody from trying anything for now. But the little brother Jamie actually likes having her around because for some reason he likes her personality. Again, people complain about Bella, but oh my god, is Wanderer just like the most bland character I've ever experienced? And that blandness is what makes it even more confusing when Ian, you know, the guy who just tried to choke her, starts to have feelings for her. And in the movie, it's even more unnatural because it's like one scene to the next. I'm choking you, the next is, no, it's not okay, we can't kill her, that makes us monsters. It's not. Human. So we stop acting human? I still don't understand why he'd be into her. She has literally no personality. Unless the personality traits you're looking for are subservience and a non-confrontational attitude. Oh. So yeah, in the movie, he's very quickly into her. Literally without them ever talking, which really puts a whole damper on the, oh, I don't like you for your body, I like you for your personality part of the story. Which I assume was something that was supposed to be important thematically, but... It. So while all this is going on, they're still sending people out on raids to get supplies. And that's when we're blessed with the store store. So in case you missed it, the souls basically just work whatever job they're assigned and then they can get access to whatever they want. If they need food, they just walk in, grab food, walk out. You don't need to pay for it. So obviously there's no real reason for branded items, but I really doubt they would have rebranded the stores because I think they probably would have seen that as wasteful. But yeah, once they started making food, it probably would have just been like oatmeal. It honestly just looks like I walked into a superstore. But these raids are actually highly violent in the movie. I guess it's to kind of show how dire the situation is, but they also act like absolute idiots when they're out on these raids. But it actually shows two of the humans having to kill themselves by slamming into a brick barricade so that they don't give away the hideout if they end up getting captured. You know, in the book, they're like kind enough to have like cyanide capsules and stuff, but that's not flashy. And the worst part about that is that they get caught in the middle of the day and literally the only thing they had to do was drive the speed limit. They literally would not have been detected by anybody because nobody would have any reason to suspect them of anything if they just followed the rules. Like, how do they simultaneously make things less stupid and more stupid than the book? Anyways, the overly obsessed Seeker accidentally shoots one of the other souls when trying to shoot the humans, which really kind of puts a damper in the whole non-violent thing. That is not at all soul behavior, Miss High and Mighty. You know, totally non-violent other than hostile planetary takeovers. But while Jared is away, Jeb is essentially tricking people to being more confident with Wanderer, now nicknamed Wanda. In the movie, they really only have her helping out with work and chores. In the book, she's doing that, but also telling all these crazy stories of the past lives she lived, like this ice planet with bears, the spiders, and underwater coral world, which is all really interesting stuff, so it's kind of a bummer that they completely omitted it from the movie. I get that they had a minimal budget, but could have been cool. And Ian's definitely falling for her, but she's also falling for him. In the book, it actually takes her forever to be like, uh, what do you mean he's interested in me? I'm just a gross parasite alien. That's not possible. Also, we love Jared. And Melanie is not at all happy with that interest. She's like, you think you have a crush on Ian? Here's some mental images of me smooshing Jared. 
Jared. Okay, never mind. That was actually Jared's dream, which makes no sense, but still. So Jared is obviously pissed that Ian has staked some kind of claim on Wanda because Wanda is obviously inside Melanie's body. And I remember when I was reading the book, I was like, oh, there is a love triangle, except it's like between two people in the same host body and this one dude. But it's actually some up for some where the body loves Jared so much that it actually makes Wanda think that she loves Jared. But she also likes Ian who likes her, but Melanie is pissed the belt fat. So they can't really do anything because the body loves Jared so much and then Jared obviously loves Melanie in the body. But Melanie also hates it when Jared touches her body because Wanda's the one who's in control of it. Is that, is that everything? Also, I saw an interview where Stephanie said her intention was to make this more of like a love story with people closer to their 30s. Originally, um, these characters are a little bit older, and so I was picturing people more in their, you know, late 20s and early 30s. Which is true for Jared and Ian, but absolutely not true for Melanie, who is likely currently 20, but was 17 when she met Jared. If you wanted this to be older than Twilight, why did you set up underage couples? You're in control of this. Why? But yeah, Jared kisses her to try to see if Melanie is in fact still inside the body because he's not fully convinced. And then Melanie slaps the shit out of him. No, no. <laughs> which I still thought was a weird tactic to prove this point because if Wanderer just wasn't into him, she could have also slapped the shit out of him for assault. But before we can get too cozy with our quadrupling, Ian's brother, you know, the other one that tried to kill her, tries to kill her again. And this is super brutal in the book. She gets smashed around, he almost breaks her leg with a rock, and then tries to launch her into a water vortex where she would have drowned and disappeared forever. But the script is flipped when Kyle's the one who almost gets launched into the water vortex. But kind, sweet Wanda chooses to save him, even though Melanie's like, let him drown. And her damn compassion even has her lying for him because she knows if she tells the truth, Jeb's gonna want to kill him because those are the rules they've established. So she saves his life and then Kyle's like, oh, you know, life for life, that's an even trade. Won't try to kill you anymore. <laughs> and then immediately goes to play soccer. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I personally would not feel comfortable with anybody who could just casually try to murder somebody and then go play sports. This is about where the book actually introduces another underage coupling. Now I can't fully guarantee this, but the book says that Jamie has just turned 14 and we're introduced to a character named Wes who couldn't have been many years older than Jamie. So I'm thinking 16-ish, maybe 17. And he starts dating this girl named Lily who clearly has an issue with the age gap and actually mentions, I'm way too old to be dating him, but what does that matter here? Stephanie, why did you feel the need to do this? this no bearing. No bearing on the plot, none at all. But once again, we can't get too caught up because Jamie accidentally cuts his leg with a scythe when he hears a helicopter overhead. In the book, this was like slightly more heroic. He tripped on a raid and stabbed himself. Like maybe we should just sit this kid in a really nice corner and just, just leave him there with a book. But the issue here is that the souls have essentially destroyed all forms of human medication because their medication is so crazy wild and effective that there's literally no reason for it. So when someone sized themselves with dirty farm equipment, that's kind of a recipe for a bad time. But things are about to get even more dramatic. So in one of the raids in both the movie and the book, they bring back a soul. Because I guess the doctor's been trying to see if you can separate the souls from the body, which makes sense. They have to believe that there's some way to do that to retain any kind of hope. Now the book handles this in a way where Wanda accidentally stumbles upon it, sees the blood and freaks out, calling them all monsters, which is still what happens in the movie. But the book specifically has Jared being like, I don't understand, I covered the bodies. But it's Ian the one who points out that the souls are just lying there in plain view with their blood splattered everywhere. And he's like, didn't you stop to think about what seeing that would do to her? Other than the whole hostile body takeover, they're super peaceful species that don't like violence. But man, Saoirse Ronan is a fantastic actress. I will watch her in anything, but oh no, the acting in this movie sometimes. <laughs> So she goes into mourning and smashes Melanie so hard that she disappears for three days. And it ends up being Jeb who gets through her to explain the reality of what they're going through. They're a species on the verge of extinction trying to survive. They have to try something and they're not trying to be barbaric. But while she's been in mourning, a couple things have happened. One, Melanie is gone and won't come back. And two, Jamie is essentially dying from an infection. So first things first, she gets Ian to kiss her to try to piss off Melanie and bring her back. And it doesn't work. Sorry champ, you just don't mean that much. So then they bring in Jared to kiss her, which of course ignites the burning flames of young love and then Melanie bites his lip. Stop! Ah! Oh, wow. Melanie, you bit me. 
because again, she's just mad that he's kissing her. It's all good. She didn't kill the host spirit. Yay! So Wanda convinces Jared to take her out to get some of the soul's medicine. So she stabs herself to mimic the injury that Jamie had and then has to cut her face so she can reopen a scar that was there from getting smacked around because I guess one cut just wouldn't have sufficed. And then she just walks in. Souls have no reason to distrust anybody because people don't lie and they just interpret weird behavior as nervousness and probably blood loss. So she ends up clearing out a bunch of the medicine and then in the movie she ends up leaving with one of the hibernation pods. So they save Jamie and everyone realizes, wow, she can just walk right into places and nobody questions anything. That's kind of useful. So they take her out on a raid, but it's still so weird to me that they just stand there outside the car wearing sunglasses with all of these like parasitic aliens walking by them. Like there is still an entire group of these souls whose job it is to hunt down humans. You'd think they'd at least maybe try to hide in the car a little bit, but they get back without a hitch, except that while they're gone, the crazy seeker showed up and shot Wes, who is distinctly older looking in this movie than he's described as being in the book. So they manage to get her under control and then Wanda asks if you can speak to her privately and realizes, hey, there might be a way to save both you and the host body because I really don't like violence and even though you suck, I don't want you dead. Because surprise, Wanda actually knows how to separate the souls from the bodies. Something she's obviously been working super hard to conceal, but now she cares so much for the humans that she's willing to sacrifice herself so Melanie can live. She doesn't want to go to another planet and be another parasite, doesn't want to take over another unknowing human, and she doesn't want them to keep unintentionally murdering souls and humans humans in the attempts to separate them. Her motivations here aren't really explained in the movie, like why she wants to die, but just trust they do like a pretty decent job with it in the book. Man, I wonder if there's ship fan fiction for Melanie and Wanda, yep. So they manage to separate the Seeker from the host body and they send the Seeker off to a far away different galaxy. And the human actually comes around and it turns out the reason why the Seeker was so obsessed with finding Wanda was because she too could not drown out the original spirits. In the book, it specifically said that the reason why the Seeker is such an insufferable bitch is because the human's an insufferable bitch in this you know, they keep that up with the Seeker, but the human's actually all right. So now they're ready to do this with other souls. But sadly, some of the souls had taken over their hosts for too long or when the body was too young so that there really isn't any semblance of the human spirit there anymore. I don't want to really think about the horrors of that reality, but anyways. The book also shows that some souls are having human babies, so I don't know if like the long con here is to just reproduce naturally and hope that the humans that are brought up in this world just totally function on nurture over nature and that you can train them to behave the same way that you do. But now it's Wanda's turn to be separated. So the movie deals with this a little bit more gracefully than the book. People are sad, Ian's upset, they don't want to let her go both because she's useful and because they've grown to like her. Even Melanie doesn't want her to die because she's grown to love her, but ultimately they let her go. In the book, Ian flat out drags her away in a fit of rage when he finds out. Come on, Ian snarled, dragging me away from them without a backwards glance. You know, at least in the movie we get this cheesy scene. You are not leaving me. I can't stay. But I love you. I love you. Don't say it like you're saying goodbye. God, this movie is rough. Like, sorry, Ian, the human that owns the body might want it back. Again, I'm still confused as to why he fell in love with her at all, but okay. So they separate her, and then surprise, she wakes up in Emily Browning's body. Don't you hate it when that happens? So in the movie, they explained that they couldn't let her go, so they put her in a hibernation chamber and continued separating souls from humans. And would you guess the luck? They came across an age-appropriate attractive female girl that just wouldn't come back to her body. So they just popped her right on in. Seems fine, I guess. With the book. Oh god, the book. They abduct what appears to be a young teenage girl from her house, pull out the soul, and then plant Wanda inside it. But the real stickler here is that she realizes that she's turning 17 in two weeks. And Ian is pushing 30. So she's concerned that Ian, like Jared, will get caught up on these logistics of, you know, underage relationships. So she says, I lied, giving myself an extra year. I'll be 18. Stephanie, no! Also, for some unholy reason, it's specifically mentioned in the text that she looks even younger than the 16 she actually is. Ah! Like, I get that mentally Wanda is like over a thousand years old, but we're not gonna get into the whole logistics of, well, she's mature for her age when the body is underage and is specified as looking even younger than that underage. As the great Klaus said, If the words use the word technically, you're already in trouble. Like I'll even give her Edward, when he was turned into a vampire, he was mentally and physically frozen at the age of 17. He's still a weird stalker, but I'm gonna give it to them. But the stuff with Jacob and the imprinting and it not being like that until presumably Renesme is older, which is literally grooming. And then all the stuff that's in this book, like why did you need to add that in? 2008 was a messed up year for Stephanie. Like why couldn't you just find a host body safely in her 20s? I'm so upset. Anyways, both the movie and the book end with them running into another group of survivors that also have like a converted 
perverted soul who's okay with helping the humans. Leaving things wide open for a potential sequel or trilogy, and I'd say, well, you know, it's been 12 years, so I doubt that's gonna happen, but we did finally just get Midnight Sun. So who knows? So I guess what I'm saying is, Read Axiom Zen by Lindsay Ellis instead, or just watch Bong Joon-ho's The Host. So that's The Host. Remember, in the multitude of vast galaxies and amazing worlds you can come across, humans are still the best. So yeah, it's not great. From a movie making standpoint, it really wasn't handled that well. From a screenwriting standpoint, it really wasn't that well. And you absolutely underutilized Saoirse Ronan. Like, I am so glad she was given Academy Award worthy roles after this movie that truly let her shine and succeed because, oh boy, was this rough. But yeah, that is gonna do it for today's video. Let me know what you guys are thinking in the comment section down below. Have you read it? Have you watched it? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters. Anybody who's watching the video, leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. Subscribe if you're new. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay and we'll catch you all later.